five, four, three. Wayne's World up in this bitch. We're doing some NFL draft. It'll probably be re- released the week of the NFL draft. Yes, I was thinking that, actually. That's a good uh, lineup, just like Jake Taylor, baby. Absolutely. Welcome to the Sports Experience Podcast. I am your co-host, Dom DiTola, here with my co-host, uh, Chris Quinn. And today we're going to do a little NFL draft action. Yeah, a little uh, 1996 NFL draft. Some say it was uh, the most stacked NFL draft. Definitely in a couple of positions. Definitely in a couple of positions. Uh, maybe not the most stacked all time, uh, particularly in at the most sexy position quarterback that's what i go into that's what i wanted to bring up because uh if quarterbacks were like at all viable in this draft they could have been like the most stacked draft it is not and i will go super aspergery into that as far as the best quarterback in this draft in my opinion however let's get into the 96 nfl draft yeah let's i was gonna say let's just get into some wide receivers let's get this (laughs) i mean in all honesty, this is the best wide receiver draft that has ever existed. Yes. I, because I, I'm not huge into football. I watch football, but like the ins and outs, I don't necessarily know all of. When I saw the list of all these guys that came out in 96, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's like, unreal almost as far as the talent level at that particular position. Yep. And especially as the NFL was moving in into a passing league pass first only type of deal well this is the question the first question that i have for you because this is why i love this podcast is i have these little questions and dom's got the answers but in this in this era it's very run heavy right like it's very uh control the clock very not as open as we see the west coast yes. offense isn't out yet exact well i mean you're seeing particular teams like pushing that 50 50 range into passing yeah but now and especially now in 2020 wide receiver is basically running back at this juncture yeah as far as oh yeah you can get an elite level talent in the fourth or fifth round and you don't need to worry about it and this is the first draft to really ram it home in that idea yes i guess i can say like that's the only way i can describe it and uh, taking place April 20th and 21st, 1996, at uh, Paramount Theater at Madison Square Garden. And uh, seven rounds this time, unlike uh, the previous draft, 1989. You have some undrafted free agents that I will later get into who are very talented, who aren't wide receivers, actually. Yeah, but this is what we see the talent pool go so deep that it's not like one or two undrafted guys. Like it's like there was a ton of undrafted talent in this, in this class, I guess is what you call it. The best way I can describe it is this draft isn't sexy from the perspective where it's 1971 or 1983 or 1999, where a quarterback and a group of quarterbacks are taken. Okay. Wide receiver is the first pick in this draft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it just don't stop. (laughs) Well, and it shouldn't because we see all the way into like the third round, we have high, high level wide receivers being taken. Well, and if you want to talk about it as far as wide receivers, you have Keyshawn Johnson, number one, drafted number one overall by the Jets. Poor goddamn Jets, right? Yeah. Poor Jets. The year where they need a quarterback, quarterbacks aren't there. And then you have Terry Glenn taken at number seven, Eddie Kennison in the first round, Marvin Harrison, Hall of Famer in the first round. And then a list of other guys who are Pro Bowl players like Eric Moulds, Bobby Angram, didn't make the Pro Bowl, fantastic. Terrell Owens, T.O., yeah, Terrell Hall Owens, of Famer. Yeah, you got to give it up to him. I wonder why he dropped so far. Well, he was a college basketball player in addition to a uh, wide receiver at a one double a school at UT Chattanooga. We can go into that later, <laughs> but uh Moussin Muhammad, yep. great wide receiver for the Panthers and bears. Amani Toomer won a super bowl with the giants. Uh, Jermaine Lewis, a fantastic kick returner for the Baltimore Ravens. Joe Horn, 
terrific wide receiver, pro bowler for the uh, New Orleans Saints. I mean, you have so many guys not named Eddie Kennison and Bobby Ingram from Penn State making the Pro Bowl who had productive NFL careers. Those two had amazing NFL careers. Yes, yes. But it rolls in, and this is at a weird time for the NFL because you have teams looking to move. And I mention this because you have Hall of Famers drafted by a specific franchise who just moved. Ray Lewis and Jonathan Ogden are first-round picks in 1996. When we finally get football back in Baltimore. Exactly. And we had mentioned in the Burt Jones episode. Why don't you go and listen to that? (laughs) Well, let's well if we're getting into this because this is the two positions that are that were unbelievably stacked in this draft was wide receiver and linebacker. And linebacker wasn't thought to be a position stacked. Okay, so that's that was my next question was coming into the draft everybody knew about the wide receivers, everyone knew that the quarterback thing was empty, but nobody really knew about all these linebackers cuz I looked through the list of them and it's like Oh, these are flat out the linebackers that were playing in for a decade in football. Like it, it's everybody that I would associate with, you know, Ray Lewis, Zach Thomas, Teddy Bruschi, who has the best name. Oh, absolutely. In From that U of A. Yeah, in that era. I'm just saying. Um, but you know what I mean? It's Simeon Rice. Like if you're saying linebacker, they're coming out of this draft. Yes, exactly. This is one of the drafts where you're building the rest of your roster, not named quarterback. Yeah, exactly. Again, Jets, I feel so bad for you. And it always pisses me off about the Ravens as a Steelers fan is they're sitting at four, right? The best player considered in the draft, not even wide receiver, just the best player is someone we brought up on episode 21 of our sports experience podcast in the Nebraska dominance of college football in the nineties, uh, Lawrence Phillips, a running back. And when the Ravens moved from Cleveland, which was just goddamn awful. Yes. Let me just mention that. Um, they were looking for somebody to bring fans into the stand, some fanfare, uh, owner Mar- art model wanted to bring Lawrence Phillips into the Ravens and Ozzie Newsome, uh, Hall of Fame tight end, by the way, for the original Cleveland Browns, uh, was no, not at all. We're going by our board. We're going by the Belichick strategy. They took offensive tackle Jonathan Ogden. Jonathan Ogden, if you aren't familiar, was basically one of the greatest offensive tackles who has ever existed well and this is what they lucked out on the the ravens was because lawrence phillips like you were saying everybody was looking at him like this is the guy that we can build around nobody was looking at him like this guy's going to be fucking problems yeah I, and despite the fact he had so many problems yes. which you can listen to in episode 21 of the podcast you know, we'll probably even bring it up a little later too i don't you know who knows but they they just completely lucked out so six nine three hundred fifty pounds just he basically shaded the goddamn sun for a decade and a half in baltimore so wait what you were saying is that if they hadn't picked him up he would have been a stealer Oh, was God. This, no. No, this, well, I'll get into that later in the draft bus portion. Okay. But Jonathan Ogden at 6'9", about 350 pounds, 11-time Pro Bowler, four-time All-Pro, uh, one-time Super Bowl winner, 176 starts yeah. for the Ravens. I mean, coming out of UCLA, that's the best offensive player, regardless of receiver, coming out in this draft. And Baltimore was like, no, 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 we'll take him. And what was interesting was Baltimore slash Cleveland at the time yeah. actually had a really good offensive line. Ogden's first year, he didn't move to left tackle until they traded Tony Jones to the Broncos. Oh, okay. okay. So he spent his first year in the NFL at left guard just like, no, 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 we're taking the best possible player and for the next 15 years, he can play for us and be awesome. The the Belichick 
strategy, which I feel like is so accurate because of how many pieces you can move. So like you were saying, they have yeah. a great offensive line, but we can move one piece and get one of these great receivers or one of these, you know what I mean? And, and that's why for drafting, I feel like that's the best strategy. Yeah, and so they – Pass on Lawrence Phillips, which we'll get to later. Yeah, how we'll, it affects we'll double back. my favorite. <laughs> there you NFL go. That's what franchise. I was. But uh, this was a draft that saw 32 Pro Bowlers and uh, five undrafted free agents make the Pro Bowl. One of which will be in the NFL Hall of Fame yes. once his uh, eligibility arrives. I was going to say we're going to see a lot more Hall of Famers come out of this class. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But I mean, the first. This is a draft which I can explain. It's the last actual draft to feature a quarterback not taken in the first round. Yep. And the one that was taken first, Tony Banks at 42 overall by the now St. Louis. Well, I shouldn't say now St. Louis, then St. Louis Rams. Now Los Angeles Rams again, Tony Banks. Yeah. And... He wasn't even the best quarterback taken. <laughs> no. Well, I feel like the thought of quarterback in this was let's try and fit a piece in, not necessarily like let's go get the best quarterback. Uh, uh, a ridiculous stat that I saw for this was half of the QBs that were drafted never played a down. Precisely. That's. I mean, that kind of puts it into perspective. Like this was not a quarterback draft. Well, I'll say this now. I I won't say it's nice, but the best quarterback picked up this offseason is John Kitna. Oh, okay, yeah. John Kitna was picked up by the Seattle Seahawks from Central Washington, a local guy. He ended up having a decent NFL career as mostly a backup. He had started he led the Seahawks to a division title in 1999 as their starting quarterback. But that's how bad the quarterback draft is in this was this is the guy that stand out. And it know? always makes me laugh at the Jets by going, God, you can't suck in a year where the quarterback is the best. Yep. Oh, and like they literally couldn't pick a quarterback in the first or second round. That's what's so fucking funny. And about they the took Jets. two wide receivers. Yeah. No disrespect to Keyshawn Johnson. No, he's great. Right. You know, I mean, by that same token, uh, John Kitna, a 50 and 74 career record. That's, I mean, hey, you know, he won 50 games. Let's just yes, give the guy that's, credit that's right there. My, uh, that's my, that's what the sound I made was pretty good. You know, 50 games in the NFL, you can't knock. But as far as Pro Bowlers in uh, the first round of this draft, you had Keyshawn Johnson. He made three of them. Won a Super Bowl in Tampa after the Jets traded him. After he had that kind of contract yep. fallout and the Wayne Corbett issues and things like that. Over 800 catches in his career. Yeah. I mean, he was kind of the stud where you're thinking, well, there's no quarterbacks left. Let's just take him. Let's just pick him up. But then pick number two, Kevin Hardy for the Jaguars. Great outside linebacker in that Illinois type of tradition of that era. You know, made it in 1999, over 700 tackles. Simeon Rice, who maybe he's a borderline Hall of Famer. Yes. Taken number three by the uh, Cardinals. Just a fantastic outside pass rusher. Three-time Pro Bowler, one-time All-Pro, one-time Super Bowl winner. I mean, he finished his career with 120 sacks. Yeah. No, I, I, those are Hall of Fame numbers. Um, if he had a Super Bowl under his belt, I feel like we would. Well, no, he did. Oh, he did. I mean, he did with the Bucks. Oh, with the yeah. Bucks. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're right. Yes. They, I was thinking they, they had right. signed him as a high price free agent yep. from the Cardinals. I remember who took now. him in that draft. And then obviously Ogden. And then uh, Terry Glenn made a Pro Bowl for the Patriots. Yep. Uh, Bill uh, Parcells, not Belichick, who was coaching the Patriots at that time. Different Bill. Didn't really want him. A slight kind of type of wide receiver. Uh, he had made that reference uh, to Robert Kraft, Handjob McGee, as everybody knows now. Uh, well, if they're going to let you uh, go shopping, they might as well let you pick the groceries because they were probably looking at some defensive players to uh, solidify their future AFC championship team. But uh, Glenn made a Pro Bowl. And then uh, Cincinnati, oddly enough, picked up a pro bowler 
in oh, that yeah. first round. Uh, Willie Anderson, uh, just an absolute rock I remember watching at right tackle for them and uh, later the Ravens. Uh, three-time All-Pro, just an absolute mountain of a man at uh, 6'5", 340. Uh, Bears picked up Walt Harris, uh, Pro Bowl corner. And then uh, the Colts, because... In that juncture of the first round where there was so much swapping, they picked up Marvin Harrison. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here. And uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. Probably their, I mean, definitely their best wide receiver, but probably one of the best wide receivers of his era. And I wanted to bring this up because wide receiver is one of the only positions where you can see two absolutely different body type, different type of receivers, but you could still kind of compare them. So I was thinking about this, like Marvin Harrison and like Terrell Owens, like they're not necessarily the same type of receiver, but they were both so good or like Marvin Harrison and Keyshawn Johnson. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the guy had over 1100 catches for over 1400 yards and a Super Bowl title. He was there in Indianapolis before Manning even showed up in yep. Indianapolis and was producing. And then at 14, because the Oilers, which is always weird about this draft, which I noticed is that like the NFL was going through a time of flux, right? as far as franchises moving cities and everything because the Ravens had just moved from Cleveland. Seattle was trying to move to Anaheim to give the NFL an L.A. franchise. Yeah, because this is before the Rams. Yeah, this is before anybody does anything and the yep. NFL had blocked it. Um, but Houston picks up in the first round Eddie George, who was a fantastic, you know, just absolute bowling ball of a back for them and led them to a Super Bowl appearance and an AFC title. He had over basically 10,000 yards, 68 touchdowns, and 2,200 yards receiving. Yeah. I mean, he was just fantastic for them. And then the Lions, later in the first round, pick up Jeff Hardings, who's an offensive guard for them, and later on moves to the Steelers and becomes an all-pro center on a Super Bowl-winning team. And then you have Eric Moulds later in the first round, another one of these wide receivers. Eric Moulds is kind of lost to history because basically he played his entire career with shit quarterback play. Yep. He had just under 10,000 yards receiving. I mean, that guy was an absolute beast at over 6'2", 220. And then you get even further down, Jermaine Mayberry, Pro Bowl right tackle for the Philadelphia Eagles. And then some guy who was an undersized, quote, end quote, inside linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens from a first-round pick that they acquired in the previous draft from San Francisco, Ray Lewis. You ever hear of Ray Lewis before? Well, and this is something that I don't think we'll ever see again is we see this um, new franchise in Baltimore. I say new franchise, but you know what I mean. Um, this this Baltimore Colts, uh, you like that? This Baltimore Ravens team have the best draft in the first round I think you will ever see a new franchise team ever have. It I is mean, legit on the level of Sayers and Butkiss. Yes. For the Bears in the mid-60s. It's pretty ridiculous. Like They pretty much were like, all right, we're going to have our offensive captain and our defensive captain and just in this draft. Like Ray Lewis was such a great pickup that – it's pretty ridiculous. No, I mean, the guy made 13 Pro Bowls and had over 2,000 tackles, 41 and a half sacks, 31 picks. I mean, he was a rock for them. He won yeah. two Defensive Player of the Year awards for them. And then it's not even the end of the first round. I was just going to say that. It's not even the end of the first round. Jerome Woods was a really good safety for the Chiefs who ended up making a Pro Bowl. And... Like I had said before, this entire draft is non-QB centric that if you're doing your homework, you're going to get the right guy. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'll say this. The, uh, the class that we see come out isn't like any other class. That's why I think this one is so unique with the, like we were saying, the quarterbacks essentially not even like making a dent. No. And, mm-hmm. and we see all these Hall of Famers kind of coming out. Like it, it's really interesting. Well, in the second round, I wanted to bring this up. Everyone was talking about um, Pittsburgh trying to acquire Mike Allstott. Oh, okay. Who was six-time Pro Bowler, three-time All-Pro, fullback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Super Bowl winner, great player. Um, He kind of slipped once Pittsburgh decided to take well-known draft bust Jermaine Stevens at offensive tackle. And the reason I bring that up is a very significant trade took place. Yeah, this is what leads the Steelers to need a running back. Yes, they need a running back. And the reason they need a running back, particularly a power back, is in 1995, the Steelers had a terrific power back named Byron Bam Morris. Bam Morris... 1993 Doak Walker Award winner, top running back in college football. They took him in the 94 draft, played well, split time with Barry Foster. 95, split time with Eric Pegram as their scat back. Let him do a Super Bowl appearance. So they're pretty they're pretty confident that this guy is going to be here for at least a couple more years, and they really shouldn't need a running back. Yes, shouldn't That's, need him at all. Yes. And in March that offseason – Cops in Texas find him driving with six pounds of marijuana in his car, which don't get me wrong. Totally agree with you should have as much marijuana in your car as humanly possible. However, not according to American or any state laws right now. Yeah, exactly. At that juncture. Turns out the plants you had were illegal and the lines you crossed were not imaginary. And you can get the fuck out if you're applying or uh, abiding by that goddamn Puritan logic. Anyway. (laughs) Well, it's it's rough because we see and you have to go through like, why would he do this with his NFL career? You know, just he'd have been a legend in Pittsburgh. Just budding, it, yeah. Because he's like 240 pounds, yep. six feet tall. I mean, he's your perfect power back for this offense. And then it's just why do you need six pounds? I why guess do you I need- guess I guess your take is why don't you need six why pounds? Why don't you which need I, six I have pounds. to agree with. Damn it. You're right. <laughs> but it's so it's just like you're a rich man, get somebody else to drive it for you. Like it, that's the kind of shit you're just like, come on, man. So this happens in March and they're basically left with their dick in their hands yeah. because look, Eric Pegram, as Jerry Glanville said, was tougher than a two dollar steak. Yeah. Like Eric Pegram is a great scat back, tough as nails. They wouldn't have made the Super Bowl without him. But you need a power back. Foster's gone. Like, you have nothing because all this Morris shit is up in the air. Yep. Luckily for them, the now St. Louis Rams are looking to get rid of Jerome Bettis. Jerome Bettis, someone we brought up on the Rocket Ishmael episode, if you will go ahead and listen. Yep. Uh, Hall of Fame, NFL running back. They. Here's my question, though. Why did St. Louis want to get rid of him? I didn't understand well, I'll, this. I'll tell you why. Rich Brooks, who was their coach at the time, had just come from Oregon, fresh off a uh, Rose Bowl appearance okay. in his first year in. Uh, Los Angeles and or well it wasn't in Los Angeles it was in St. St. Louis. Louis yeah uh Bettis's first year in St. Louis after gaining over 2400 yards in his first two seasons with the Rams goes to St. Louis only gains 637 because he doesn't fit Rich Brooks's offense oh okay so it was like a scheme he didn't fit he wasn't power running yeah and Rich Brooks apparently treated him like shit Oh, okay. Yeah. And he was like, well, you're not good enough. We're going to make you a fullback in this offense with Leonard Russell. Like, we're going to find our guy, which they did with Lawrence Phillips because the Ravens passed on him. Yes. So what ended up happening is like, Bettis, you're on the trade market. Who wants a power back? 
the Steelers, as per their history, raise their hands yes. and say, yes, we would like him. Yes. What will it take? What will it goddamn take? And Bettis had his own uh, right of refusal, essentially. Okay. Where he could pick the team where he wanted to go to. And the Houston Oilers at the time yep. wanted him in addition to Pittsburgh. And Bettis went with Pittsburgh, allegedly, due to their storied history. Which is why the Oilers took Eddie George, because oh, okay. they couldn't acquire Bettis. Okay. So it took a um, third round and fourth round picks. Yeah, third round this year, fourth round next year. Exactly. Yep. And swapping second rounds to, uh, or giving them a second round pick to acquire Bettis. But and the Steelers went and did that. Yeah. And a lot of people were claiming, oh, you paid too much for him. That was the thing that I saw was that it was. Almost like a, a fact that they paid too much for him. And then it was like a couple of years down the road and they were just like, oh, no, we were wrong. Yeah, <laughs> right. that was that was silly of us. <laughs> well, for Lawrence Phillips, and you can listen to that in uh, episode 21. But oh, I'll just say this about your own Bettis. Uh, 10,571 yards, uh, 78 touchdowns uh, during his career with the Steelers. Uh, won Super Bowl as well. And uh, yeah. You fucked up, Rams, you goddamn idiots. Yeah, it, it's... And we talk about this. It's one of the, these little things that teams need that then, like, it's like a domino effect. And it kind of goes... Like, we see it reverberates throughout other teams. And it, it's really great. I, I love that. And that's something that I love about the draft is it's it has those situations that ripple out. Yeah, and... You had so many Pro Bowl players taken throughout the rest of this draft. Yep, that's Torrey what I was just James, looking at. Torrey James, a huge cornerback. While he didn't make it in Denver, he surely proved it for an AFC title-winning team in Oakland and Cincinnati. Um, Brian Dawkins, who's a Hall of Fame safety for the Eagles, absolute beast, four-time All-Pro, All-Decade team for the 2000s. Yep. Donnie Abraham made a Pro Bowl for the Buccaneers as a corner. T.O. T.O. You want to go into T.O. a yeah, little bit? Yeah, let's get a little Terrell because I always thought he was, for me, I never liked him as a receiver. I always thought he was silly. But looking back on the shit that he did, it was actually really, really fucking funny. Dude had almost 1,100 catches for over 150 touchdowns. Who do you think? Here's, here's a question before we, we give out too much on him who do you think the best receiver in this draft was to do you think he was oh yeah yeah okay uh, despite all his other off field yeah. bullshit no that's his only doubt that's that's it that's no, the only thing that anybody it's, could it's it and when I marvin go, harrison was my other you know what i mean for what he did with the colts look marvin harrison is a hall of famer but T.O. is... T.O. is on a, another goddamn Top level. five this receiver of all time. Like, yeah. 6'4", 220 pounds that, of yeah. this goddamn man. That's the like, thing. is like, how could you cover him? He was so fast. Look at all the quarterbacks T.O. played with compared to Harrison, who played basically every season but two of his without Peyton Manning. Yeah. And this no is shit. no that's, dis that's a great one. Yeah. This is no disrespect to Marvin Harrison, who no. was a Hall of Fame receiver, held the passes caught in a season during his career. Like this is no disrespect to him, but it's T.O. But it's, it's T.O. Easily yeah. T.O. Hell yeah. But you have other guys, fourth round or third round, Ton uh Donnie Edwards. Then you have Steven Davis, who is a great running back for the uh, Redskins and the uh, Panthers. Then you have John Runyon, who was a rocket offensive tackle for the um, Oilers, Titans, and uh, Eagles, as well as um, Joe Horn. Joe Horn is one of the best stories to come out of this draft. I don't know if you researched him at all. No, I didn't get too into Joe Horn. Give me, give me it. So Joe Horn was another one of the wide receivers, mm -hmm. multiple pro bowler, not necessarily a hall of famer, but he made multiple pro bowls um, drafted in the fifth round by the Kansas city chiefs um, played 
two years of college ball at uh, Itawamba Community College okay. in Mississippi. Um, was working at a restaurant and used most of his last $5 to buy a Jerry Rice wide receiver drills videotape from Blockbuster Yeah, to try out for CFL and even NFL teams. That's wild. I know, right? It's absolutely insane. And he was a he was a great player for the Saints pre Katrina. Oh yeah. Like, this guy was absolutely legit. Size, speed, everything. The Chiefs took a gamble, rolled the dice on him, and in his last year before free agency, he finally popped. They didn't end up signing him. The Saints did, and he really shined under Jeff Blake and Aaron Brooks is like I said, pre Katrina, pre Drew. Well, Drew Brees. Well, that makes sense that he didn't pop right away, but three, four years in the in the league, and then he pops because he didn't have this, you know, college background that everybody else had. Which, well, he had yeah, four Pro that. Bowls, over six hundred catches yep. for almost nine thousand yards, and then uh, another guy I want to get into. While he's listed as a wide receiver, he didn't really play wide receiver for most of his career. But uh, Jermaine Lewis, Jermaine Lewis was yeah. an absolute stud as a kick returner for the Baltimore Ravens. Yep. Returned a kickoff in the Super Bowl in their Super Bowl win in 2000, 2001. I mean, as a Steelers fan growing up, that's all I prayed was they didn't kick it to Jermaine Lewis. That's how good this guy was, like, at the special teams aspect of the game. Yeah. But then... Fifth, sixth round, you get to the Miami Dolphins, as we talked about before, as linebacker in Zach Thomas. Yep. And Zach Thomas, as most scouts pegged, under six feet, under 230 pounds, not supposed to be a guy who will, you know, be a factor. Well, he, he's looked at as a, a fifth round gamble because his size, people are saying that he can't overcome his size. He can't overcome his size, but he overcame it enough to yeah. make seven Pro Bowls, five times <laughs> all pro, 2000 decade team. Uh, twice led the league in tackles, over 700 or uh, 1,700 tackles, and uh, basically a mainstay at middle linebacker for the Dolphins for a decade and a half. Well, that's what I mean with these guys coming out of this draft is. They're on like their mainstays on these teams for the next decade in which it was like the decade that I watched football. The uh, like, that's why when I went through all these wide receivers, I was like, I know all these guys. You go through yeah. all the linebackers. You're like, I know all these guys. Like, what the hell? Like go through the quarterbacks. You're like, I know none of these guys. Like it's, right? it's perfect. I, I love how this draft is set up, especially to screw over those damn jets. That's <laughs> <laughs> Those damn Jets, and then the year after, Peyton Manning doesn't want to come out in the draft to get drafted by the Jets. Yep, I, saw I will always maintain that conspiracy theory. Well, I mean, it's not too crazy. I'll say that. Yeah, it's not, right? you know. <laughs> Nobody wants to go to them. Uh, another pro bowler that uh, made it out of this draft from the sixth round uh, from San Diego State, oddly enough. Oh, dang. Uh, 6'2", 285 pound defensive lineman named Leroy Glover from Point Loma High School. Six time pro bowler for the Saints and Cowboys. Okay. One time all pro. Absolutely fantastic. Marco Rivera later in the sixth round. Three time pro bowler from Penn State. And then one of the undrafted guys who needs to be mentioned, Adam Vinatieri. Yep. You ever heard of this guy? Um, I believe he's a top quarterback. No, he's a kicker. He uh, is a kicker. <laughs> doesn't he have the longest kicking career? Or am I crazy about that? I don't know if it's the longest, but he did kick for over two decades. That's what I mean, because I remember seeing something about him where he had like a crazy long year or a crazy long career. But yeah, he's 24 seasons. I, I just looked him up like it, it, he's such a great kicker i don't think anybody cares about kicker which is kind of accurate but this is in this era but this is like when people are like oh they like they could really cost us the game if they're not competent competent yes yeah well i mean i know we brought up jan stenerud yes in that uh chiefs and dolphins episode 
But uh, Adam Vinatieri, uh, four-time Super Bowl winner, and let me bring this also up, uh, two of the Super Bowls, he won in expiration. And that's what I mean. If he wasn't clutch... You know, but, but it wasn't that he was just clutching money. He led the league in field goal percentage three times. Yep. And led the league once in field goals made. And since he had had a career that was so consistent and so awesome, at the end of his career, as far as eligibility concerns, he'll be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Oh, because he's a not doubt. quite there yet. Yeah. But as we had described before, this was a loaded draft with guys that even if they weren't Pro Bowl players, they could still produce. Yeah, they were playing on, on their teams for a decade. Like Seattle traded down twice, got interior lineman Pete Kendall, who started 185 games in the league. Randall Godfrey, a great and versatile Inside outside linebacker played for the Cowboys and Titans. Roman Oban, an offensive tackle who was a key cog in that Eli Manning to the Giants trade. Oh, okay. From Louisville in the third round, he had started over a hundred games in the NFL. Tyrone Williams, someone we brought up committing crimes in our Nebraska episode. Yes. Started for basically seven, eight seasons for the Packers. Earl Holmes, a great inside linebacker for the Steelers. And this is where I want to point out, despite the fact the Steelers cocked up the beginning of this draft outside of Bettis, they found some fantastic defensive players in this draft. Late in the draft. Earl Holmes from Florida A&M. Earl the hitman goddamn Holmes. What a goddamn stud for them he was. 6'2", 242 pounds, had... Almost a 1,000 tackles in the NFL. Fred Miller, outstanding offensive tackle for the Rams and Bears and even Titans. He started over 100 games in his NFL career. Chris Villarreal started for the Bills, was a fantastic player for 148 starts. And Orpheus Roy in the sixth round for the Steelers, 6'7", 330 pounds, played the five technique, played on the interior line, member of their 2008 Super Bowl winning team after he came back from the goddamn Browns. <laughs> Why would you sign with them, you... Ugh. In the middle of his career, in the middle of his prime... Ugh. Dusty Ziegler, center for the Bills in the uh, seventh round as well. Started basically uh, 78 games. Carlos Emmons, inside linebacker for the Steelers who drafted him. And then the Eagles. He had a very productive NFL career. Jay Reimersma for the Bills was a very productive tight end. And Keith McKenzie was a solid outside pass rusher for the Packers for a short period of time. So... Uh just to reiterate this this draft was just stacked top to bottom and we see the teams that win that go on and win the super bowls over the next decade pretty much like have players coming from this draft and it it wasn't a sexy draft no that's, that's the thing that i love that's kind of the reason why i wanted to pick it is it's not a sexy draft but, like, for people our age, when you see all the stars coming through in the NFL at yep. that juncture, you're like, oh, my God, they all came from this. Yes. They all emerged from this. With zero top-end quarterbacks. Yes. It, it's zero. Such, I love, when, yeah. When John Kitna's your best quarterback, <laughs> and this is no disrespect to John Kitna, No, by we the said way. it. 50 wins. I'll take it. Yeah. And but, he's undrafted and he wins 50 games exactly. in the NFL. Do you know how incredible that is? Winning one is incredible. Yes. But, yeah, it's it's not sexy. But by that same token, the amount of talent that is emerging, and even guys that don't make Pro Bowls, like an Amani Toomer or a Bobby Ingram, you're just like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. Where did this come from? I feel like the the sexiness of it is because it is – is so unlike all the other drafts. Well, and if we want to do a 97 draft, the quarterback class isn't necessarily sexy because Manning told the Jets to go fuck themselves. Yep. But <laughs> Well, I mean, and that 
I mean, you can look at that as kind of a dick move, but I, I feel like it was in his best interest. So well, to... he's got eligibility left. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not wait for a better setup? And we that could be another podcast down the road. I will just point out that my fantasy team nickname in uh, the Tucson Phoenix uh, comedy group is the Bam Morris Ganja Express specifically because of this draft. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast, and we're on Instagram, Totolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much. <laughs>